Good morning. I'm the Reverend Amy Richter, and I'm here with the Reverend Dr. Joe Pagano at the Parish Rectory. And this is a service of morning prayer for Sunday, October 17th. Thank you for joining us today. Lord, open our lips, and our mouth shall proclaim your praise. O God, make speed to save us. O Lord, make haste to help us. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Alleluia. The Venite. Come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout for joy to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving, and raise a loud shout to him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. In his hand are the caverns of the earth, and the heights of the hills are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands have molded the dry land. Come, let us bow down and bend the knee, and kneel before the Lord our Maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Oh, that today you would hearken to his voice. Today's reading is from the book of Job, chapter 38, verses 1 through 7 and 34 through 41. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind. Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Gird up your loins like a man. I will question you and you shall declare to me. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? On what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone when the morning stars sang together and all the heavenly beings shouted for joy? Can you lift up your voice to the clouds so that a flood of waters may cover you? Can you send forth lightnings, so that they may go and say to you, Here we are. Who has put wisdom in the inward parts, or given understanding to the mind? Who has the wisdom to number the clouds? Or who can tilt the water skins of the heavens, when the dust runs into a mass, and the clods cling together? Can you hunt the prey for the lion, or satisfy the appetite of the young lions when they crouch in their dens, or lie in wait in their covert? Who provides for the raven its prey when his young ones cry to God and wander about for the lack of food? The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
reading from the Gospel according to Mark, chapter 10, verses 35 through 45. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came forward to Jesus and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And Jesus said to them, What is it you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit, one at your right hand, and one at your left in your glory. But Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink, or be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They replied, We are able. Then Jesus said to them, The cup that I drink you will drink, and with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. When the ten heard this, they began to be angry with James and John. So Jesus called them and said to them, You know that among the Gentiles, those whom they recognize as their rulers lord it over them, and their great ones are tyrants over them. But it is not so among you. But whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave of all. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In the rough and tumble world of the schoolyard, one of the most frequent insults kids hurl at each other is loser. As in, Joey so-and-so is a loser, or your big brother is a loser. And as we all know, these insults sting. They sting because it seems like kids, like all of us, would rather win than lose. And as the old saying goes, show me a good loser and I'll show you a loser. It's also the logic of bullies of all ages. Ridicule the apparently weak and vulnerable. Stigmatize them. Tell others not to waste their time hanging out with losers, but rather to join the bullies in their sham fellowship of supposed victory and viciousness. That message lives on beyond the playground. Something inside of us likes to be associated with success. Successful people intrigue us. We study the secrets of highly successful people. We like our sports teams better when they are winning. In the world of politics, it's also thought important to back a winner. Maybe if we are close to successful people, some of their success will rub off on us. If our political candidate wins, who knows, maybe she will remember us when she gets into power. Maybe a nice contract 
will come our way. Maybe our company will get a nice tax break. Who knows if we play our cards right, we might get appointed to be an ambassador or a cabinet minister. It seems like human beings are always trying to move up on the scale of importance. On the playground, we sang about being the king of the castle. In our adult years, we aspire to upward mobility. As Carlisle Marney put it, Americans are addicted to salvation by successing. After all, who really remembers the runners up or the fellow who came in fourth and didn't make it onto the podium? Somehow we think if we are successful, if we are winners, then we will be fulfilled. Then we will be valuable. Then we will be important. Then we will be powerful. Unfortunately, religious folks have been no exception to this rule. Church history often reads like the painful saga of craven leaders choosing power over love, institutional success over sacrifice, control over the cross. There seems to be something inside human beings that wants to exercise power by lording it over others, even in the church. And if we can get some power by hanging on to the coattails of someone on the way up, so be it. In our gospel lesson for today, we hear the story of James and John, two of Jesus' disciples, who thought they were backing a winner. They had been following Jesus since he came on the scene in Galilee. They had seen Jesus say and do extraordinary things. They had heard him preaching about the coming of the kingdom of God, and they left everything to follow him. They decided to stake their whole lives on the mission of Jesus. And they were betting that when God's kingdom came, Jesus was going to be a winner. So one day, James and John come to Jesus with a request. And as you may have noticed, they approach him in a rather peculiar way. They say to him, teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. There is something fishy going on here. It sounds like a couple of kids trying to get away with something. Sounds like children going to their mother and saying, I want you to promise to do whatever we ask you to do before we tell you what it is. You've got to promise first. You've got to swear you'll do it. Ever hear one like this before? Hear a request like this and you know something is up. Apparently, Jesus knew this too. Notice that he does not make any promises. Neither does he scold them, something he is quite capable of doing at other times. Rather, he cuts through the baloney, cuts through the game playing and asks, what is it that you want me to do for you? Just get to the points, boys. What do you want? And there is grace here. Grace in cutting through the bunk. Grace in getting to the point. And grace in him 
making himself available to his followers, even his rather fishy followers. So James and John finally spit it out and say, grant us to sit one at your right hand and one at your left in your glory. And there it is for all to see. The naked ambition of James and John. They see Jesus as destined for glory and for them that means destined for power. They see Jesus as a powerful ruler, maybe someone who is going to crack some heads and take back power from the Romans. They picture Jesus as a powerful king, seated upon a throne of glory, with his attendants seated beside him, one on his left and one on his right. These seats on the left and the right are also places of great power. And they are asking Jesus to promise that when he becomes a powerful king, that he will remember them and give them a couple of choice seats in his court. They see Jesus as destined to be a winner, someone on the way up in the world. And they are hoping that he will bring them along for the ride and give them a couple of positions of power in his kingdom. And after all, don't James and John have some reason for expecting a little payback? Didn't they give up everything to follow Jesus? Didn't they leave family and profession to follow him? Why wouldn't they expect a little something in return on the day when their guy comes out on top. But James and John just did not get it. Jesus tells them, you do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? Basically, Jesus is saying that his disciples do not have a clue as to who he is or to what his whole mission is about. Jesus did not come to crack heads and take back power. He was not destined to be a powerful ruler the way earthly rulers are powerful. Rather, the cup he drinks is the cup of suffering the cup of his blood poured out for others. The baptism with which he is baptized is his passion and death. Basically, Jesus's cup and baptism point to the cross. And because the cross is the only earthly throne he will ever occupy, he doubts James and John really know what they are asking when they request to be on his left hand and his right. After all, who will be on Jesus's left and right when he is on the cross? Do James and John really want to be on his left and his right when he comes into his glory? This is not about following the king to his castle, but to the cross. This is not upward mobility. It is downward mobility. This is not backing a winner. By the standards of the world, James and John are hanging out with a loser. But Christ is showing his disciples that true greatness is not found in climbing to the top and exercising power over others. Rather, true greatness, true leadership is found in self-emptying 
self-giving love. Unlike worldly rulers who lorded over others, Jesus tells his disciples, whoever wishes to be great among you must be your servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave of all. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. This is basically the gospel in a nutshell. And the spelling out of what the good news of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ means for his disciples. It is still shocking, or at least it ought to be. It's rather easy to point out how Jesus' vision of true greatness, found in self-emptying love, clashes with the lifestyles of Armani-clad businessmen with slicked-back hair and glad-handing politicians building up their war chests. But in our Gospel lesson, G Jesus seems less interested in simply criticizing the ways of worldly rulers and more concerned with the ways in which his followers are aping the behavior of worldly rulers and trying to lord it over one another in the community of his disciples. It's less about the failures of the world and more about the corruption of the body of Christ. And that means the sting of Jesus's words and the shock of recognition must begin with the prelates, the priests, and all the people in the community of disciples who are called to take up their cross and follow Jesus. Trying to lord it over one another, blaming one another for the decline in membership and influence of our church, shaming the losers, and scrambling for the remaining seats of power are not to be so among us. Rather, we are called to follow the one who came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. We pray, Almighty God, whose dear Son went not up to joy, but first he suffered pain, and entered not into glory before he was crucified. Mercifully grant that we, walking in the way of the cross, may find it none other than the way of life and peace. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. God who restores us, may your people be true and faithful servants of Christ. Lord, hear our prayer. Bring those who are drawing near to the light of faith to true knowledge of you. Lord, hear our prayer. Give our families and friends joy and satisfaction in all they do. Lord, hear our prayer. Comfort and sustain those who are lonely, sick, hungry, persecuted, or ignored. Lord, hear our prayer. Help us to contribute to the true growth and well-being of our country. Lord, hear our prayer. Empower the whole human family to live together in justice and peace. Lord, hear our prayer. We ask God's blessings and healing grace for Melvin, Denise, Glenn, Audrey, Diane, Cecil, George, Shirley, Janelle, Noreen, Clarence, John, Anne, Audrey, Donna, Eileen, Dave, Suzanne, Cody, Penny, Danielle, Sean, Howard, Byron, Joy, and Sadie, Doug, Noreen, Johnny, Sean, Kim, Doug, Faye, Connie, Deanna, Stuart, Herb, Joe, Linda, Dorcas, Marilyn, Barbara, Connor, Cavell, Irving, Joan, Marion, and Debbie, 
and any you wish to name now aloud or in your heart. Almighty God and Father, your beloved Son willingly endured the agony and shame of the cross for our redemption. Give us the courage to take up our cross and follow him in newness of life and hope. For he lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Gathering our prayers and praises into one, let us pray as our Savior taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. The peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you this day and always. Amen.
go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.